AM Events Glasgow Limited is a family-run business that specialises in the creation, planning and management of events, whether that be weddings, charity and corporate events, right through to the celebration and party events. We pride ourselves in customer satisfaction and have our clients at the centre of all that we do. Our best boat services allow us to bring your dreams to reality. We offer our services from the smallest of detail to taking on the full event, releasing the worry from our clients and strive on exceeding expectations. Our showroom is open daily. Please pop in to discuss how we can help. Make sure you click the link to subscribe to my YouTube channel and also click the notifications button to be notified for when my next podcast goes live. You can also follow me on my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest is. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Thank you. And we're on. Today's guest, we've got Noel Razor Smith. How are you, Noel? Not bad. How's yourself? Yeah, really good. Thanks. First of all, thanks for coming on the show. No problem. Um, you've got a very interesting story. Spent over 30 years in prison. 200 banks you've robbed. Um, but while you were in prison, you taught yourself how to read and write. You've come out, won all sorts of awards for publishing articles. Now you're doing great things. You're 10 years out, which is your longest yeah. stint ever out of prison. But we'll go right back to the start kind of where your life began and where you grew up and stuff? Well, I suppose really uh, I was born in London. My parents were Irish immigrants from Dublin. They came over in 1959 and uh, I was born in 1960 in Charing Cross, in the old Charing Cross Hospital and really grew up until I was nine in, in North London. Um, and we kind of moved around a lot, as a lot of families did in those days, and North London was still suffering the effects of the Second World War. I mean, seriously, there was like bomb sites everywhere, houses pulled down all, all over the place. And um, we were just really normal kids, you know. We just rammed all the bomb sites and uh, done the usual stuff. And then when I was about nine... There was a big problem over in where we lived because obviously the streets were full of derelict houses and pulled down houses. Um, and there was like four families living in a house, I suppose a bit like Glasgow, you know, in the 1930s in the tenements and that. And they were mainly Irish, mainly Irish immigrants. Um, so we lived in a house, we lived on the ground floor, at the basement rather, and um, there was another three families living on each floor other three Irish families and one of the families had a newborn baby and left it outside the house in the sun um, in the pram one day and came out about 10 minutes later and there was a rat in the in the pram biting the baby so the local papers got involved you know me mother and all the people off the um there used to be a television program that used to be on in the evening called today with Eamon Andrews and it was like a sort of regional news program and they all went on it about Hollingsworth Street, which was where we lived. And all the families told how bad it was down there and everything. And what happened was the council took notice, decided to demolish the whole lot, and they gave us all a choice of moving out. So most of the people that lived on the street moved to places, estates in North London. But my granddad was living in South London at the time, so we accepted a place over in South London in Ballum. And it was really strange because it was the first time we ever had... Uh, uh, the house we lived in, we were in two rooms. So it's the first time we ever had hot running water um, and heating, actual heating. There was a gas fire in the house attached to the wall. We couldn't believe it. Yeah. It was unbelievable luxury to us. Um, so me, me and my brother had a bedroom and my sister had a bedroom and my parents had a bedroom. Um, but we lived on the top floor of a block of flats. And, you know, I found South London a bit different and um, we eventually fitted in over there, and uh, it was pretty good. Is that when you started life of crime very early? Mm. Was it 13, 14? Yeah, I was 14. Um, and, I, you know, I, it's like saying I started a life of crime. It was more a bit of fate, really, that, yeah. that brought me to a life of crime. I never set out to be a criminal in the traditional sense. I wasn't really one of them kids. I nicked a few apples out of orchards and stuff like that, and... Uh, Nick the odd Mars bar out of Woolworths and, um, 
you know, but I was never really sort of, I used to like Dixon and the Duck Green and Zed cars and I proper had a bit of respect for the police. Even though my dad was, a, he was a, like, he had no respect for the police at all. He was a hard fighting, hard drinking Irishman, a proper Dubliner. And um, he taught us how to fight really, me and my brother. And when we first moved to South London, our main problem was we moved on to an estate where there was a load of kids the same age as us and we're the newcomers. So we had to fight everybody on the estate yeah, before we were accepted. Yeah, had to learn fast. And yeah, yeah. But kind of get your reputation. See, when you got you got your first, the jail, first when you were 14, yeah. but did you get beaten up by the screws? Well, well, before that even happened, I mean, what happened to get me into jail in the first place was the fact that me and my mate were bunking school one day, we were playing truant. And uh, what we used to do was, because I went to a, uh, one of the toughest schools in South London, Tulse Hill Secondary Modern, it's pulled down now. It was eight floors of... Uh, glass and concrete and it was a boys school 1800 boys all taken from the catchment area Brixton Stockwell really rough areas of South London so it was a bad bad school you know it had a bad reputation by the 70s and uh, the teachers there was a thing on the news uh, at one time that the teachers had to be escorted to their cars at the end of the day in case the kids attacked them <laughs> so it was one of them. I ended up um, trying to punch a teacher out the first floor window so there was loads of fights and stuff going on in the school. We, it, there was no learning really as such, you know. And um, so we used to play truant. So me and me mate Mick are up in a place called Gypsy Hill in South London one day, just, you know, in a school uniforms, walking along, messing around. We had an idea that we were going to go up to the museums and try and pull a few girls, you know. I mean, girls' schools used to go on uh, trips up there. So anyway, we're walking along and all of a sudden the van pulls up alongside us, an old comma van. And uh, about three or four big blokes jump out in work clothes. Never really took no notice. And they come around and gathered around us. Suddenly, we're grabbed hold of and dragged into the van. So we don't know what the fuck's going on. So they get us into the van and they st start slapping us about in the back of the van. The van drives off. And one of them has grabbed my hand, he grabbed me by the wrist. And another one got me finger and twisted me finger until it snapped. So I became unconscious at this stage, they brought me round again, but, but they're still doing me mate as well, brought me round and uh, one of them tried to break me other finger, you know, break his other one, break the other one, so what they were, they were a local burglary squad, who had a bit of a reputation at that time around there in the 70s, uh, for violence and fitting people up, we knew nothing about it, we were school kids, but what they wanted us to do was to admit to burglaries, so they could get off the day, you know, they'd been to the pub at lunchtime and thought, well we get a couple of likely lads to admit to a few burglaries that's us done for the day so by the time we got to the station we were absolutely terrified we'd never been nicked before it's the first instance of um dealings with the police i've got a broken finger we're in bits my mate's got a black eye uh, we were willing to admit to anything I, I was willing to admit the sink in the titanic starting the second fucking world war <laughs> anything you know so they got us um they got us into the station and they got the big book out and we cleared up 62 burglaries for them. Every one they put down, we said, yeah, we've done that. Because we were terrified we were going to get killed. So we were 14. And what happened was, my mother come up to pick us up because obviously they couldn't let us go on our own. And when she saw my injuries, she went into one, obviously. And when what happened? And the police told her that me and my mate, they'd found us on top of a wall trying to climb into a house, to break into a house. And when we saw them and tried, and they chased us, we fell off the wall and that's how we got our injuries. So anyway, cut a long story short, about three weeks later, we appeared in the juvenile magistrate's court. We told a solicitor, the duty solicitor, we'd never done any of these burglaries, don't know anything about them. So lucky we had a magistrate then who was willing to listen. You know, in the 70s, magistrate's courts were police courts, but we had a, a fairly decent magistrate. So she ordered an investigation. She was wondering how two 14-year-old boys were doing burglaries, some of which were done at three o'clock in the morning, and antiques were stolen. Grandfather clock was one of the charges. We were, yeah. you know, two Top kids. jobs. Yeah, what the hell were we going to do with a grandfather clock? We didn't even have a watch between us. So anyway, she ordered an investigation after the brief explained everything and give us bail. And lucky enough, they ended up dropping all the charges and we were advised to sue the police. Now... I don't know if you've ever tried to sue the police. Even these days, it takes forever. You know, you're going for years. And in those days, it was worse in the 70s. So when we tried to sue the police, it wasn't actually us doing it. It was the solicitor doing it for us, obviously. But after that, we became targets. Every time I left my estate, the police would pull me into the back of their car, give me a few slaps. 
Once they found out we were Irish, that was another thing against us as well. This is the 70s you're talking about when the IRA were active. So it was, um, you know, they'd punch us up. They'd, like, get me in a car and twist me nose or pull me ear or whatever, you know, give me a few slaps. And then they started doing it to me brother um, and telling me to drop the charges. This was the idea that I would drop the charges if they harassed us enough. And um, eventually I decided that they, they kept raiding me mother's house early in the morning. Uh, claiming they were looking for stolen goods. And, um, you know, in the end, I had a think to myself, and I thought, you know, well, I'm not doing any good here. I'm bringing the police down on that house. My dad hated that. He hated the police. Um, so I decided to run away from home, and I decided to live on the streets at the age of 14. I thought it was a way of protecting my family from the police. Um, and once I was living on the streets, I had to think again, and I thought, you know what? The only way to live on the streets is to be a criminal. So if they want a criminal, that's what I'm going to be. And I knew a fellow on an estate across the road from ours, and he, uh, I was living in an old car, by the way, on the estate, a Triumph Herald, if anyone's interested, <laughs> 1966. <laughs> but, um, I knew this fellow who had a motorbike on, the, on another estate, and he knew how to hotwire them. So he taught me how to hotwire motorbikes, and that became my thing. I would go out every day. I had absolute freedom. I was 14 years old. I was living in a derelict car. I could go to bed whenever I wanted, do whatever I wanted. So my game was I would go out and steal motorbikes and drive around with no crash helmet looking for the police cars because this is this was my war on the police. I wanted to get my own back on them. And I'd pull up alongside the police car with no crash helmet on, kick the door and get a chase. And I knew all the back streets all the way through the common and they, nine times out of ten they'd lose me. But that was my fun. And then after that, my next move was to get into the back of police stations, police station car parks, and steal their own bikes. <laughs> He's just stealing the police bikes. They used to go mad. And I'd run the bikes into the ground, then dump them into the pond up and clap them coming. So there was a kind of war going on all the way through 1975 between me and the police. Eventually I got nicked. And um, they gave me, um, what I got nicked for theft of motorbike, uh, free motorbikes, and uh, driving without a license and all the usual stuff. And they gave me what they called the short, sharp shock, which I don't know if you've heard of that, but back in the 70s, that was like government policy for juveniles. If you were aged between 14 and 17, you could be sent to a juvenile detention centre uh, for three months or six months. And the game in the detention centre, and they, they, what they'd done was they recruited all the worst horrible screws from around the country. They actually said, if you want to... You know, if you're violent, if you're a strict disciplinarian, this is where we want you, teaching these kids not to come back to prison again and commit crime. So it was like, the short, sharp shock was like a fucking nightmare. From the moment they picked us up underneath the court, I'm sitting in the court with my leather jacket on, with my collar up, thinking I'm a bit of a lad, just been sentenced to three months, a bit terrified inside, but trying to put on a front smoking a cigarette and all of a sudden the door opens two big fellas come in they're not allowed to wear uniform because we were juveniles but they wore these big long black raincoats with uh, hmp epaulets turned over that was their kind of uniform and they come into the cell and they went to me uh one of them said to me what's your name so i just looked up at him and i went no bang punches me right in the jaw I went, jesus so i've just kind of come off the floor and i went to sit down again Bang, he's hit me again. So I've gone down, I'm thinking, what the fuck was that for? So he said, stand up. He said, stand up when you speak to an officer. So I'm standing there. So he said, now, what's your name? So I said, I went to say no. Bang, the other one hits me from the other side in the head. I'm wobbling around the cell. So he said, don't want to know what your mummy calls you. I want to know what your name is. So <laughs> eventually I get it. So I said, Smith. So he said, Smith what? So I said, just Smith, bang, another one in the stomach this time. When you talk to an officer, you say, sir. Whenever you say anything, you say, sir, straight afterwards. And this was the start. They have took me out into the van. There's another two kids in there. One was about 14, one was 15. And they're taking us out to Surrey in the van to this detention centre. And all the way there, they're telling us what they're going to do to us when they get us there. And they're proper enjoying themselves. Proper say this, you know. We were terrified, us kids. So we got to the uh, detention centre, and the first thing you have to do is run the gauntlet. They, op we, they open the doors, there's about eight screws there, four on each side, shirt sleeves rolled up, kick you out the van, and as you go past, you get a slap or a kick or a punch. 
and then they got us into the reception, and um, they stripped us basically. We um, we had to stand there for um, I think it was an hour and a half naked, fourteen year old boys and a fifteen year old boy in reception with nothing on whilst they went about their business. Screws come in, screws went out. And every screw that came in or went out of reception made a disparaging remark. You know, and look at the arms of him, like bits of knotted string. You know what I mean? Are you sure he's not a girl? And all that turn out, you know, just humiliation. And what it was, I found out afterwards, it was like them setting out their marks, showing us that this is what we were going to get. And if we rebelled against it, there was going to be trouble. Stamp that I thought it, yeah. Yeah. So we were kind of terrified. And they started everything with, when I say go, you do this and they'd give you the order and they'd go go so the first thing they do to us is bring us into a bathroom there's two baths there's about six inches of lukewarm water in each bath and the screw said to us me and the other guy he said when i say go he said i want you to run in there jump into them baths and scrub your stinging bodies and then get out go and when he said go I got into the bath. The other fella took him at his word. He ran, jumped into the bath, came down, broke both his elbows, and that was him finished. He was out of the DC. They took him away in an ambulance. But that's how terrified he was. He actually took him literally at his word and jumped into the bath. Um, And that kind of taught me something. I thought, you know, this is madness. How how is this happening? I've nicked the motorbike. I've nicked a few motorbikes, and all of a sudden I'm in hell. Uh, mental abuse. Yeah, oh, it was it was terrible Physical abuse well, in those yeah. places. They had to close them down in the end. People died, kids died. But they, the things they would do is after about a couple of weeks, the thing was this: you're all in there. After a couple of weeks, you've got a common enemy, which is authority. So you know it's them and us. So at night, when the lights go out in the dormitories, if you're talking, you're all talking about what you'd like to do to them screws, and you know what you want to do when you get out. So we all banded together in the face of this kind of threat. And after a couple of weeks, there's new people come in. You kind of got to buy it, you know I mean? The screw might go to hit you properly, seriously, last week when you were new, would miss you now because you'd be able to dodge the punch, you know what I mean? There was still a lot of nasty shit in there. I mean, they'd make you scrub the corridor with toothbrushes and, you know, you're always like bed packs. You had to square everything off and uh, cleaning out the toilets with toothbrushes and all that kind of fucking shit. Anyway... After about three or four weeks, I'd made contacts in there. Where in my area, I was the only one who was really a, a bad little kid. I met other kids from other places in London and outside London who were also little bastards like me. So one of the guys I met, we're talking, we're talking away, and we, the, just what we were talking about was how to get money and, and what sort of criminals we'd like to be. Because by now, we're criminals. Yeah. You know, we, we, we've we've done the crime. We're in the place where they're beating the shite out of us every day. Um, uh, uh, so we know that when we get out of here, all we've got to look forward to is more of the same. Do you think you did that as well also because of the hate and your rage you had of oh, them yeah. putting you through that, the police and the screws, and they as if to say, fuck this, I'm not taking any shit? No doubt about it. By the time I was 15, I was so anti-authority, it was unreal. I, you know, at 16, I was punching the screws up in the air. That's how bad it became because I, I couldn't take no more. Um, so they give us a terrible beat, and I met this geezer, he was from North London, and his brother, we were talking about armed robbery, and he, and he said his brother had a couple of guns, and he might be willing to sell one to me. So at the age of 14, I get out of D.C., and about a month later, I get the money together, about, I think it was about 40 quid, went over to see this guy I'd made the contact with, and bought off him a single barrel Stephen shotgun with no ammunition, and a Luger um, with no magazine, and the barrel was bent. But we didn't care, they were guns. You know, we were going to do an armed robbery and we need guns. So I found a couple of fellas who uh, who were pretty much of the same mind as me. They wanted a bit of excitement and they didn't give a toss. I'd met them in jail in the short, sharp shock. And we all got together and decided to do a robbery. So what we picked out was a record shop. Jesus Christ. We had only seen robberies in films, obviously. So that's how we planned it. We had everything. We had pliers to cut the phone lines. We had the Luca and the, the shotgun. We had uh, rope to tie up the people in the shop. We had masks. We had overcoats. We had stocking masks on underneath the mask, gloves. And it was the middle of summer. <laughs> and not drawing attention to herself. We had the getaway driver sitting outside in a Mark 1 Cortina with a ski mask on and a big bulky jacket. <laughs> sweat pouring off him. And uh, we went into the shop to do the robbery. And it turned out 
that when we got up to the counter and I've pulled the gun out on this geezer, um, the first thing I could think to say when I pulled the gun out, and it got caught in my coat, where the shotgun had been sawn down, it was kind of like an edge on it, a burr, and it got caught in the lining of my coat. And when I pulled it out, there was a bit of red lining sticking on the end of it, like a fake gun with a bang coming out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the guy behind the counter just laughed. He's standing there looking at us two, and he, he laughed. So I went, listen, mate. I said, don't laugh. I said, stand and deliver, which is all I could think to say. Stand, you know, and, stand and deliver. <laughs> I was cursing myself <laughs> afterwards, the embarrassment of it. So anyway, we told him a bit. It said, give us the money. So he's, he's like, he's opened the till, took out a £10 note and dropped it on the counter. I said, where's the rest of the money? He said, it went to the bank at three o'clock. Oh. He said, that's what we got left. <laughs> so I said, being a bit of a fatty merchant as well and having planned all this, I've grabbed the tenner and I said, right. And my mate went, should we tie him up? And I went, no. But I said, listen, mate, this is a grown man talking to a fellow. I'm 14 years old. I said, see that roof over there? We've got a sniper on that roof. He said, and if, if you leave this shop or touch that phone in 10 minutes, he's going to shoot you straight in the head. He went, all right. <laughs> what was your favourite <laughs> film? I, had, I, I was just loved was films. Like Cowboy and yeah, endings. Yeah, I loved all that sort of stuff. So we we had watched loads of films about heists and whatever, and we thought this was how to do it. Ocean's Eleven with Frank Sinatra. <laughs> and everything. But anyway, so anyway, we got this £10, and we're on our way out the door, and there's a record rack near the door, and just out of... I don't know why, I grabbed the bundle of LPs out of the rack as well. And we jumped out, got into the getaway car, got away. So our first robbery, we got £3 something each. Um, and I ended up with about 22 copies of the Bay City Rollers Greatest Hits. <laughs> it made me popular with the local kids, <laughs> my sister and all that. She loved the Bay City Rollers, so they all had a copy of that. But And the other two guys were kind of like a bit disappointed, but I wasn't. And do you know why I wasn't? Because I realised it wasn't the money. I was doing it for the excitement and to get my own back, mm -hmm. to be in control of something rather than all the time I've been beaten by adults, uniformed adults. And, and when I was doing the robbery, I felt as though I was in control. I actually had control. So I wanted to do more. I'm bullying to get out and do more. And we did. We went and done about five or six more and eventually we'd done a rent office and nicked 200 quid, which was a lot of money in those days. Um... And then we done one where uh, we done a sweet shop where a, an Asian guy uh, fought back and we mate hit him over the head with a bottle of uh, lemonade, smashed the bottle over his head. And um, then the police really were after us. So we, we ended up getting nicked, me and my pal, and uh, got reminded in custody for the first time. By now I'm 15 um, and we go into Latchmere House. My mates, the guy who done the fellow with the lemonade was 18, so he went to Ashford, an older prison. So the police, <laughs> we admitted the robberies in the end, you know. We, we pleaded not guilty for a long time and then decided, well, let's just stick our hands up and get what we're going to get. So my brief told us that me mate, because he'd been at Borstal before, would get another Borstal sentence and I would get six months youth custody. Um, he said he'd do a deal with a judge. So we're up at the Old Bailey. At the age of 15, I'm up at the Old Bailey where me mates are all in juvenile court. And... Um, go in front of the judge and the judge says no nah. he said I'm not doing any deals here he said this is atrocious he said for someone your age to be doing this and he gave me a sentence under what was then and still is uh, section 53 of the 1933 Children and Young Persons Act and the wording of that sentence is that they were allowed to give uh, someone of 16 or under uh, a larger sentence if it would have warranted, if the charge would have warranted 14 years imprisonment or more if it had been committed by an adult. So that's how they've done it. And he said, as far as I'm concerned, you're an adult. He said, you go to prison for three years, which was a lot of time in those days. Yeah. So I'm, I'm 15, I've got three years. Me mate got three years as well. And uh, I've come out the old Bailey. Uh, at the time in the old Bailey, when I was in the, the cells, there was a lot of guys who were up like the Wembley mob, people like who were proper armed robbers, you know, proper grown men. And they kind of took me under their wing in the off bail cell. They're all sitting around the table playing cards, smoking, all in like really sharp suits, you know, and giving the screws all that. Hey, screw, go and get me a cup of tea and all that. And the screws are standing there. Yeah. These are my heroes. I'm sitting there looking. And they've seen me over in the corner, a little skinny fella, called me over here. Come over here. What are you up for? So I said, oh, I'm robbery. Whoa, and they're all giving it out. Oh, he's at the heavy already. How old are you? I said, 15. Ah, oh, fucking great kid. That Just roughly, yeah. yeah. 
So they give me tea and roll ups and everything. You sit with us, and when the screws come to put me in the cell, leave him here. So like, I'm thinking, wow, this is the life. You know, this is what I want to be. I want to be one of these guys. Do you think that was the first thing you were accepted as well? Yeah. To give you a bit of importance, well. yeah. yeah because was... if you're getting told you're no good and beaten all the time, yeah. it does break you. And it then... does. And then you get that, and it's like an affirmation that you're on the right road and you're doing the right thing. So I thought, you know, this is great. What I didn't realise, I mean, I got into the prison that night with me three years, uh, giving it the bravado as I come through. I've already done DC, you know what I mean? So I'm a hardened criminal by now, 15. <laughs> and I get in there and I, I'm in um, a special unit in Ashford for juveniles on the top floor uh, for violent juveniles. And I'm swinging the shoulders as I come in, my little skinny shoulders and that. And the screws are all like, yeah, he's three years on robbery, blum, blum, blum. So I think I'm, I've made it. Got into, the cell, <laughs> got into the cell that night. And when all the lights went out that night, because they used to turn the lights out at 10 o'clock, I just burst into tears. Missed me mother. You know, it was it was terrible. And I, I was thinking to myself, I wonder how many of them fellas who were in the courts of they'll be in their cells crying tonight, you know what I mean? Because they were all coming down going, what'd you get, Ronnie? Oh, I've got a 12 hour, you do it on your head. Yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, Jesus. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, so I got into the... I then realised the next day when I seen the governor that the sentence that I'd been given um, meant that I had to do every day of the sentence. There was no remand time taken oh. off. No, no, you could only get out by gaining parole and you were given parole. Um, you were allowed to go for parole after two years and then after two years, six months, and then on a the three-year mark, they'd let you out. So not even half? No. And they had nowhere to put us. There were so few of these Section 53 sentences of juveniles that they had nowhere to put us, so they had to put us in with the other juveniles in the ballstool system. Now, in the ballstool system, you got six months to two years, but your date was nine months. Most people went home within nine months. So I'm doing three years. I'm going to last about four ballstool sentences. So they, they found a ballstool for me called Dover, um, and they put me down in Dover, and I just went into one like almost from day one, I just didn't want to do this sentence. You know, you don't. Human beings are not meant Caged. for captivity, yeah. you know. Especially kids, you know. When it gets to about seven o'clock on a summer's evening, they're trying to bang you up in a cell and you just want to be out playing football with your mates. And, you know, the disappointment of all that. So I turned into a, a mad thing. I used to try and fight the screws every opportunity I got. I'd try and organise all the other geezers to have riots. I remember one night there was a... We used to have to go to bed at... Uh, nine o'clock in Boston. There was lock-up time. And I remember in the 1970s, a, a thing come out, a program, uh, uh, the fella out of Dallas was in it, and he, he, he played a guy who could turn into an animal. I can't remember. He could turn into any animal. And this was a new program that was coming out, Aquaman or something. I can't remember what it was. And we were all seeing adverts for it on the telly, but it started at nine o'clock, and we had to be banged up at nine o'clock. So on this particular night, it's on, I went, fuck it, let's... Bu- but let's barricade up the television room and not go. <laughs> you know, what I mean? let's watch it. So we did. About forty of us barricaded ourselves in the telly room to watch this show, but we never ended up seeing any of it. The screws are outside. You know, they're screeching and shouting, telling us we're going to get beaten and all that. And we're giving it back to them. Yeah, we'll come and try and take us then. And it ended up in a big battle. And they turned the telly off from outside anyway because the switch was in the office, yeah. so we never got to see nothing. But it ended up in a in a terrible battle, and I got shipped down to the block, um, and I was down in solitary confinement for about a month, and then they let me back up again, and I had a fight with a geezer as soon as I was coming back up out of the block. Someone looked at me funny. Who are you looking at? Bang. You know what I mean? We're rolling around the floor together. So back down the block I go, and this time I start threatening the screws down the block, and it's an underground block. And every morning, there's stone floor, stone flags. Every morning, they put a bucket and a scrubber and a cloth into your cell, and you're supposed to scrub the cell floor. So, of course, I went, I'm doing three years. I'm not a ballster boy. I'm not dead. When they put the bucket in first, I just kicked it over. So they went, well, you have to scrub the floor. I said, I'm not scrubbing the floor. End of story. I said, I'm not doing anything you say. I'm doing three years. I have to do it all. What are you going to do? And they went, we tell you what we're going to fucking do. And they went away, and about 20 minutes later, about five of them came into the cell, beat the life out of me, held me down, and ejected me in the arse with something. Next, yeah, seriously, yeah. What Next, was it, do you know? It was like Actol. 
I found out afterwards is like it, what they call it in prison is slow me down juice. It's a heavy, heavy um, antidepressant and kind of uh, psych antipsychotic drug. That they're using a Turns you into a zombie. Word. Yeah, they t- what they say is. Um, For fuck's sake! You must have been right naughty there no, to, oh, to give you that. I was I was a wild kid, but I mean mm. they held me down, injected me with that. I'm out, and I wake up, and I don't know how long has gone by, but suddenly I'm in another ball stall. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> in a padded cell. <laughs> I wake up in a padded cell. So a guy comes to the the door opens the next morning. I haven't a clue where I am, and all I've got on is a pair of shorts, and I'm in this padded cell. And the door opens, and there's a trolley there, and there's a, a fellow in a white coat. Uh, and he's giving out medication, and another fellow with a thing, and he went, here, take that. And I went, what is it? He went, never mind, what fucking is it? He went, take it, swallow it. I went, I'm not swallowing it. He said, don't make us come in there and, and force you to swallow it. He said, because we will. And he pulled a whistle out of his pocket. He said, take it. So I, I went, I'm not fucking taking it. <laughs> so he went, all right. Just close, slammed the Another ejection. Oh, he's gone, yeah. <laughs> sure enough, half hour later, I knew the feet coming. Thinking, what the fuck? They've come flying into the cell, held me down, bang, injected, and he put the pill in his mouth as well. Yeah. Fucking hell. So I'm in this, and the next time I wake up, I'm in the same cell, the same padded cell, but I've got a straight jacket on. A pair of shorts and a straight jacket. Now, the worst thing, I'm still claustrophobic to this day because of it. The worst thing about wearing a straight jacket is that immediately your arms are incapacitated. It's the same with a body belt. Your face starts itching, your head's itching, <laughs> you can't scratch it. It's a nightmare. So I'm sitting in the corner in this body belt, in this uh, straight jacket, and the door opens. Same fella comes in again in a white coat. This time he's got a fella in civvies with him who looks a bit kinder. So he's the doctor. Ah, Smith, how are you? I'm not good. He said, well, if you behave yourself, he said, we'll take that jacket off you later on today. He said, and we'll feed you. Are you going to be good? So I thought, I'm going to fucking lose it here. So I said, yeah, I'll be good. So they come in about lunchtime, took the jacket off, give me a bit of scran and another pill. So he said, you take the pill. So I'm looking at the pill and I'm thinking, fuck it. I, said, oh, I can't be doing with a straight jacket. So I took the pill. So anyway, I'm in this cell for about three days and there's a little kind of gap in the padding I've noticed by the door. So I'm, I'm playing with that, fiddling about with the padding and I've pulled it and it's ripped and I've managed to rip a whole section of it off. So I think, fuck me, this is great. And there's a wool inside it or some kind of fucking gear, quite itchy. It's like um, asbestos. So everywhere I go, I'm now trying to rip the whole cell apart, you know what I mean? When I open the door, there's all this asbestos all over the floor me sitting there smiling at them. So I said, your pills don't work. He said, <laughs> he said the pills are not to knock you out. He said, you've had the injection. The pills are to stop the side effects. I oh. went, fuck off. <laughs> so anyway, they've took me out of that cell and eventually they put me in a strip cell now. So I've got a hole in the floor for a toilet and I've got a, 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 what I used to call a zoot suit, which was like a shiny vest and a pair of shorts, which were supposed to be unrippable. So I've took the top off and I'm playing, rolled it in a ball, I'm playing football with that. I'm in there 24 hours a day. They open the door three times a day and push in food. What age was this? I'm 15 still. Fucking hell. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm in there and, and eventually they let me out. The governor comes and he says, if I let you out the strip cell, will you behave yourself and take the medication? So I said, yeah. You know, I'd say anything to get out. So they've put me in a normal cell in the hospital. All right. So I'm there one day. Uh, I'm there for about a month. And one day, I'm looking, there's a hatch in the door, and I'm looking out through the hatch, and there's a, a fella over talking to another fella through his hatch on the other side of the landing in a white coat. So I assume he's a doctor. So I said, here, come here. I said, what's this medication you're giving me? I don't want to take it. And he went like that. Don't tell anyone. Don't say anything. So I went, what? He said, don't say anything. It was a prisoner. He'd got out of his cell had the white coat on. Him and his pal were planning to escape. He was going to get him out of the cell, hold the squirrel hostage, get him to open the door and take him out in the white coat and I was going to walk out as doctors. He said, I'm not a doctor. I'm a prisoner. <laughs> I went, fair enough. So I'm up at me hatch like that. And he's gone to the to one of the screws. He went, Officer so-and-so, he said, can you come down here and open this cell door, please? They planned when he comes down that he was going to grab him and take the keys. 
And he went, get back in your fucking cell, Hawkins. He said, well, where'd you get the white coat and how did you get out? <laughs> so I thought, this place is full of lunatics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they let me out on association for the first time. This is after about eight weeks. And there was a big room. There was a table tennis table and a telly. And I've gone in there and there's about eight prisoners, all kids, 16, 17, 18, sitting there like that, dribble hanging out their mouths. Oh, Jesus Christ, what's like this one floor of the cuckoo's nest. I don't realise that this is what I look like as well. I haven't got a clue. So there's a guy in there I knew from DC, a black fella called Vince Kennedy. So I said, uh, Vince has come as well, and he's, he's walking really slowly. I went, Vince, what happened to you? So he went, they give me that injection, the Largactol. I said, they give it to me as well, but it hasn't really affected me. I don't realise that this day I'm going, I'm the man in me. So he said, do you, want a, do you want a game of table tennis? First time we've been out the self for ages. So I went, yeah. So he said, I'll get the ball. He's gone about 20 minutes to get the ball in the office. So he comes out. He said, I'll serve. Throws the ball up. The ball's over there on the floor. It's already, and he's bringing his back back to, to hit the ball. And I went, I'll get it. And I've gone about 15 minutes. Well. This gear was unbelievable. <laughs> So we 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 became zombified really in this in this hospital. So after a course of this this medication, they said, right, they called me in to see a psychiatrist because I was in there for mental observation. And he said, look, he said we'll take you off the medication. He said, but you're gonna have to take keep taking the pills for the next I think it was the next month. He said otherwise the side effects uh, can be pretty bad. So, so I said, well, am I going up to a wing? He said, yeah, we'll send you back to a wing. So they sent me a place called Sea Wing in Rochester, which was a brand new wing out of the whole Borstal, and it was escape proof. It had been made, it had been built two years before to hold all the people who tried to escape out of other Borstals. So they put me in there. Um, so I'm still taking the pills, and then one day I thought, I'm not taking the fucking pills no more. I've taken them for long enough. So I'm by now they're not watching me so much. I'm spitting the pills out. So I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden my neck starts going. And I swear to God, I've never had anything like it. This is for not taking the pills. The side effects start kicking in. And I'm looking around, and all I want to do is see something red. I can't, I need to see something red. And my arm starts going, and my shoulder starts going, and I start rolling up into a ball. I'm actually cramping up. And they've had to get them down from the hospital, and two screws have put a broom through my arms and lifted me like that, and kept because all my legs were bent <laughs> up. And I was in agony. Trappling up. Yeah, proper cramping up. So they took me over to the hospital, gave me another injection, and it loosened me up within about 10 minutes. Anyway, they took me back to the wing, and I was, that was, um, for medication, that was me. I took the pills then to the end, and uh, they told me, if you ever kick off again in this place, you'll be going straight back into the hospital, and you'll be getting the log actor again. And the walk that the people used to do on, on, on when they were on log actor is known in prison as the log actor shuffle. <laughs> Seriously, the Lark Actor Shuffle. I didn't realise till I see other people doing it that I was doing it. <laughs> like, like a train. You like that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you think you're normal. That's the thing. And everyone else is, is like that. So is that think, like quiet? Does that numb your brain? But yeah. you, you, you're active. You know what's happening. Yeah, but, but you, you can't, can't move, move. fast. Yeah, you, yeah, you're, yeah. Like, you're reaching for a cup and you're like that. So, <laughs> so, so I've gone back to this escape proof wing and met up with a couple of guys in there who wanted to escape. And so did I. So I said, right, we'll, uh, we'll plot an escape out of here then. But it's escape proof. There's got to be a way out. And sure enough, we found a way out. And the way out was that the, the weakness was they'd given us, they'd made these wooden cell doors with a slit, an observation slit, so they could look into every cell as they went past. And they had a bolt on the outside, obviously, that they shut every night. And the lock. And we discovered, we got hold of um, uh, half a pair of scissors, which uh, someone had had on another wing to stab someone. But we made it, we ended up with this half a pair of scissors. And what we done was we unscrewed the cups. This was their big weakness, was where the lock went in, it was screwed into the wood. So we unscrewed the cups in my cell and bent away a bit of the wood, cut away a bit of wood on the inside so it couldn't be seen from the outside. That night, Christmas Eve, it was my birthday. And I thought I'm gonna, the plan was I'd get out of my cell at night, do the night watchman, wrap him up, get his keys. We didn't know he didn't have any keys. <laughs> oh, fucking hell. Opened the cells of all the other guys, and we'd all head for the wall. We had something like about three quid in real money. We had civilian clothes tucked away everywhere. We had a rope ladder that we'd made on the wing. 
which wouldn't have probably held our weight. But um, anyway, so what happens is the night watchman, they lock us up for the night. I put my foot against the door when they come round to check. And the night watchman's gone like that on the door. He's put the bolt on. And uh, he's gone like that on the door. And as I've got my foot against the, the end of the door and I'm leaning over like that, it feels solid to him. Night, night. And off he goes, checks everyone else's door. Now, when he's gone downstairs and all the screws have gone off, I've just pulled out the paper out of wood. I can see the lock, so there's no lock. All that's holding me in is the bolt outside. And we'd already done undone all the screws on the, the slit window. So I pulled that out, coat hanger, out through the slit window, undone the bolt. This took me about 20 minutes. Undone the bolt, opened my door, I'm out. So I'm out on the landing on this little spur. I'm, I'm out, lads. And they're all, yeah! fucking great we'll be home by christmas day <laughs> loving it so i'm talking to my mate at the door i said right i'm gonna go down and do the night watchman i said what i'll do is i'll creep up on him down there and, and like do him from behind and tie him up i said i'll get his keys and i'll be up to and with that i can hear someone coming up the stairs so i can't hang about and i've gone into the recess at the end of the landing the top where the toilets and showers are and i've hid in there it's dark so i hear the night watchman coming past singing so he walks past, goes down to where he has the key, his, uh, his clocky key. And as he's coming back, instead of walking past the toilets, he walks into the toilets. What are the odds? I'm thinking, Jesus. So I'm standing over in the gloom and buy a load of buckets and that, steel buckets and mops. And he's singing. So he's having a piss in the urinal. So then he goes to wash his hands and he's looking in the mirror. And he looks in the mirror and he sees me and I see his face go... He can't believe his eyes to somebody standing there. With that, I've grabbed one of the buckets, chased him out of the toilet, hit him on the head with it and knocked him out. One of the steel buckets. So he's down on the floor, but the guys can see this out their hatches. He's on the floor, there's blood spreading out from his head. I went, I've done him, I'll get his keys and open it. They're all going, don't open me up, don't want nothing to do with it. Nobody wanted nothing to do with it now. You've killed him. <laughs> Is he dead? And I'm going, well, he's not breathing. <laughs> and they're going, no, 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 fuck that, we're nothing to do with it, don't open my door. So I went, right, fuck it, so I'll do it myself. So I've gone downstairs to the office to look for his keys, and it turned out he was just playing possum. I've heard the bell go. I thought, the alarm bell. I thought, what's happening here? I've come running up the stairs, and he's standing there with blood coming down his face, a big smile on his face with his finger on the bell, and he went, you're fucking dead now. <laughs> and I thought, oh, no. So now all the night watchmen, the pat patrol that are on the night, are coming over to this. Uh, all I could do is stand there. There's nothing I can do. Mm -hmm. They've come in, they beat the shit out of me. There was about four of them. Not only for what I'd done to him, for getting out of the cell, you know, I mean, just the fright of it for them, me out of an escape-proof cell. And they probably give me a hiding. And I always remember, they then held me, one of them held me hands behind me back and went to the night watchman, give him a few in the belly. <laughs> you know, but the night watchman was so weak mm -hmm. from loss of blood that he was hitting <laughs> me and I weren't feeling it, but I was going, ah! <laughs> give him his bit of satisfaction. And off I went down the block, and I was down in that solitary confinement for nine months in an underground cell. And this was all the age before the age of 16? Yeah. Yeah, fuck. I had my 16th birthday down there. Shit, man. Yeah, and then in, a, in a strip cell. How did that mentally fuck with you? I, it done me completely, seriously. For such a young age? I used to... Uh, the thing was, there was a rule of silence in the block as well. We were juveniles, so there was, there was no talking, no singing, nothing. You only spoke when the screws spoke to you. You saw the screws three times a day. They'd come and put your meal in. That was it. Uh, you were allowed a shower every two weeks. You, were, you weren't allowed to exercise in the open air at all. So there was no gems or nothing? No, no exercise. And your window in the cell was like a, a bit of perspex that had been there since 1906 or whatever, and everyone had scratched on it, so there was very little light come through. And I couldn't read it. I couldn't read and write at this time. And the only thing you were allowed was they had an old cupboard with a load of old books in, and every day you were allowed to get a book and change your book. Your bedding came in at um, 9 o'clock at night and went out again at 6 o'clock next morning, and you were left in a bare cell except for a piss pot and a book. So because I couldn't read... I used to take my socks off, roll them up, kick them around, play football with my socks. You know, and sometimes I used to stand in the corner and I used to sing into the corner of the cell, in the, like into the gap. But they'd hear me. Bang, bang, bang. Smith, shut up. Right. And then I'd wait till they'd go and then I'd act out all the films I'd seen because I'd seen loads of films. <laughs> and I, 
I'd play all the different parts on my own, standing there in the corner of the cell, you know, uh, tough guy, huh? oh yeah, yeah. James Cagney. Yeah, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Do you think that's what kept you sane as well? It was. Try to play it act, it was. actors in there and just try to take your mind off of things that you're locked up in a fucking cage. You had to do something and I couldn't read. But what the thing was, it, they never tell you, they didn't tell you how long you would have to be in there. So I'm board of visitors, which was the visit magistrates. So they can lose me unlimited bird. But I've got no bird to lose. I've got to do my whole sentence. So they said, right, are you two year parole? You're not getting it. I wasn't getting it anyway. You know what I mean? But what they done was they kept me down the block for nine months. And every day the gov this was the torture. Every day you had to stand by your door to attention. You sell out to be immaculate, like the floor scrubbed and everything. And the governor would come down. And he'd open the seat, they'd open the cell door, name a number to the governor. And you go, Smith, uh, PJ2679. And, he go, and the governor would go, good morning, Smith, how are you? And you go, fine, governor. And, he, and no, this is what you're waiting for. All right, you can go back to the wing today. Never came. Every day I'm there standing to attention. Every day I'm trying to get out. Try to be nice, like, yeah. try to do what they're saying, yeah. jump through hoops. Yeah. After so, that then, so... That was your first three year sentence, yeah. And you get put into the big boy, yeah, yeah, yard. So, what happened after the three years? Did you get out, or did you your sentence I, get kept on? I learned on? the reading in books. I learned the, the reading first three years, which, which was a good thing. Yeah, in that block, funny yeah. enough, there was a priest, a Catholic priest, used to come down, and he used to look through the hatches every day and see that everybody was okay. So one day he's looked through the hatch and he said to me, "Why are you? Why are you? I had the book." He said, "Why are you kicking that book around?" I said, "I can't read." that's disgraceful I could read a little bit but I couldn't you know really understand reading and writing so he he made it his job to bring me in easy readers and like Janet and John and all that and he would help me with words and and he asked them if I could have a pencil and a and a pad and the governor said he's not getting no pencil he'll stick it in an officer's eye we can't afford for him to have a pencil he'd have a pad and he'd have crayons so I'm 16 down the block with me crayons and all that <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> It was terrible, but I, I went mad down in that block. I really did. Before I learned to read, um, I started getting paranoid, and down there everything echoes, and I could hear the screws talking in the office, and I, I convinced myself eventually like that they were talking about coming to kill me and coming. To, the worst thing was I got into my idea, idea in my head. They were talking about going to kill me mother, so I could hear little bits of things and put them together, and I said, well, "What did they mention my mother?" So eventually what I'd done was I was allowed jeans by then. I ripped the tag off my jeans off the zip, sharpened it up on the wall and cut my wrist. I pulled the fucking veins out of my wrist because I went mad. I thought they were going to kill me mother. So I've ended up back in the hospital again. Um, this time, lucky enough, they didn't dose me up. And after I'd, as I'd spent nine months in the block, they let me out into the proper ball stall and I ended up doing the full three years. How was your family's reaction to you doing all this? Did they know half the, half the stuff you no. got up to? No. no, I mean, my mother was great and my dad was great. They'd come and visit me when we when they could. But, you know, I kind of did, I wasn't one of them kind of people who wanted visits. Visits just reminded me of home, you know, and yeah. I just, I wanted to do me a bit of bird and get out and get away from it sort of thing, you know. I mean, I didn't, re but my mum and that come up, my brother and my sister visit me on a quite regular basis, I'd say about three times a year. How was your mindset then coming out after that three years? Because that story there itself mm. and that three years is unbelievable. From loony bins, putting in with the adults, um, cutting your wrists, mm -hmm. hearing voices, all the medication, Being all the beatings, yeah, yeah. Straight 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 him. By the time I got out, I was um, I was eighteen, and um, nearly nineteen, and I was just ruined. For a nineteen-year-old, I knew too much. You know, it's like I, I probably had post-traumatic stress disorder and didn't even know it. You know, what I mean. I'd had beatings all the time, and I hadn't settled down at all. I'd, I'd fought them all the way. So for me, getting out, it was a chance now to get my own fucking back. You know what I mean? They haven't got me anymore, and they're never going to get me again, was the idea. And I come out, and nobody expected me after that all that time to actually go straight. It was like accepted that I was the kind of criminal of the area, and that's who I would be. Even my family kind of, you know, my dad tried to you know, talk to me about getting a job and all that. And, and, and um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But really, I went back and found a few of my mates who'd been in Borstal and we went out thieving again and that was it. I, you know, I ended up be becoming a proper armed robber and um, over the years robbed many, many, many places and worked with different gangs. They say over 200 places? 
that according to the flying squad, I mean, they, they say I've been involved in 200 armed robberies, but I was a working robber. Mm. So every time I was out, I mean, we were robbing a bank every week. Mm. Sometimes we'd rob two banks in a day. I robbed three banks in one day one time and lost money. <laughs> How'd you work that one out? <laughs> I fucking lost money. Fucking but, um, you know, I, I was always at it and people knew I was game. So I was forever, there was no mobile phones in those days. People would pull up outside your house, knock at the door. Listen, we're going down to a post office in Surrey. Do you fancy it? How much is my way? Four grand? Yeah, I'll have some of that. You know, it was one of them. So I would go to work with anyone. So I was involved with all different gangs um, until I put my own gang together and decided to, uh, you know, to really try and smash it and get enough money to retire on. And that didn't really work. Is that what you try to do? Get your own fund, try and yeah. get some cash. What were you doing with your money? Wasting it. The, the, the bank robber's creed is this. Don't let them, any thief, don't let them catch you with the money. Spend the money, because if they catch you with the money, you've done the crime, you're going to be doing the time, and you ain't even had no benefit. So spend the money as quick as possible. I spent the money on suits. I was a telly boy. I used to go out and buy, like, fucking 500-pound suits, get them made for me, any styles I liked, cars. I didn't have a driving license. I'm 18, I've got about 30 cars, you know what I mean? <laughs> it was absolutely crazy. Not not great cars, yeah, not yeah. like second hand, not, mm -hmm. nothing like Bentleys or anything like that, but Mark II Cortinas and things like that. <clears throat> and it was like, I don't know, we just spunk the money. We went out every night and we, we, we just, you know, the money was nothing to us because if you nick 10 grand a day, in three days' time, you might, you know, your mate might come around and say, oh, I'm, I'm down to my last grand, you fancy doing another one? And I'll go, yeah. Come on, let's go. So you're still craving that buzz with the robbery. Yeah. It gives you that high, I'm in control yeah. because you've been beating up so much. I need to do this and that gives you that energy, that adrenaline yeah. kick that I feel alive. That's what I wanted. Yeah. I wanted that. That is what I've done it for. I mean, the money was great, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But for me, the real thing was the buzz. And I didn't realise how common it was until I actually spoke to other people in adult jails about armed robbery. And they all talk about the same thing, the, the, the adrenaline rush. You know, that you get of being in control of something for a change. If you take over a bit of pavement, if you're doing a van, you own that pavement. When you're in the banking premises, you own those premises. People have to do what you say. But I was never one of those kind of, uh, although everyone probably says this, but I was never one of those bully fuckers who, you know, people would, I would terrify people. Don't get me wrong. That was my job. I was the frightener. That, that was my job in the gang. But... I was never one for gratuitous violence. We, our, our way of thinking, the people I worked with, was this. If you won't have a fight and hurt somebody, go to football Saturday or go down to the pub Saturday night or Friday night. You're bound to get in a tear-up if you want one. If you're out robbing, it's a professional job. You don't gratuitously shoot at people or stab them or even touch them. I was told by a, a, a professional armed robber who I met an old guy early on, he said the best thing to do he said, when you're doing stuff like that, he said, don't let anybody get within arm's length of your gun. He said, because when they get within the reach of your gun, that's when you might have to shoot them because they might try something. Try and grab it. Yeah, so always, kept, and I always done that, always kept people at arm's length. You over there, as soon as I used to come in, I was the, the growler. So I'd send people up the end of the banks and shit like that. I had many, you know, many strange experiences as well doing that. Because stuff. doing all that as well, when you say you did three in a day, that's yeah. fucking, it takes some balls as well to do that. But everything has a ripple effect as well because it does affect the people who are behind the counters. Of course, so yeah. It affects everybody. So when you're doing that as well, what was the, when you got your big sentence, which was 27 years, hmm. what robbery did you do then? I've done a series of robberies um, with a mate of mine where we were kind of, they were, I wouldn't say really vicious robberies, but they were traumatic robberies. I mean, it, I was working with a guy who, who kind of, his idea of, of getting people to open up, because I don't know if any bank robbers have ever told you this, but there's times when you go into a robbed bank, you don't get nothing. You know what I mean? If the count, if the staff all drop down behind a bulletproof counter and refuse to give you anything, not a lot you can do. You know, you've got to swallow and walk out. And we used to always say, well, there's a million more banks to rob out there. So, you know, we'll just go to the next one. But I, had, I was working with a guy who kind of used to, he had this habit of grabbing customers. If they tried to not um, give us the money, he'd put a gun up to the customer's head. I wasn't really, I didn't want to get that close to customers, you know what I mean? But that was his way of working. And it the, it was kind of vicious. It's terrifying for the people it happens to because they don't know that he's got no bullets in the gun yeah. or he's not going to kill them. You know what I mean? 
Um, did you ever get done for ones that you never done because you did that many? They just threw a couple at you that you never done. Loads of times, yeah. yeah. When you get nicked, they go. I remember one time that I got nicked by Tower Bridge Flying Squad, and they said, um, "They said we've got you for um, I think it was eleven robberies." They said we're going to throw three more in as well, which we think you may have been involved in. And I was nowhere near any of them. But I'm pleading not guilty, so I can't say, well, I've done them, but I didn't do them. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? They've got you. It's a case yeah. 22. But um, then what happened was, when I got me 27, I, I got that got cut to 19 on an appeal. And then I was a recipient of a, a bit of good luck. I'm in um, Albany Prison on the Isle of Wight when it was a dispersal jail. And there was a ruling made um, in law I can't remember, uh, Regina V, the governor of Woodhill Prison. Uh, not Woodhill, uh, another prison. But anyway, what happened was, is the prisons hadn't been given people their remand time um, when they were nicked on multiple charges and they had, hadn't had bail. So you were just starting your sentence from the day. But the High Court ruled that everyone had to have their remand time back. So doing the 19 years, I'm suddenly eligible for parole. Mm -hmm. I've done 10 so all of a sudden they're coming to me and say, oh, I'm not like that, parole. <laughs> so I've, I've thought, I've tried it, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So I went for parole and, I've, and I was granted parole in 1997. I couldn't believe it. 11 years you did. Yeah. And and I, I'm, I'm the worst part of it was I was still a B cat. So I'd gone from an A cat to a B cat. And three months before I wanted to, to, to three months before they offered me the parole, it come out of the blue. I'd asked my personal officer, who's supposed to do all your paperwork for you, if he could try and get me down to a CCAT so I could get to a CCAT prison. I wanted to escape from the CCAT. It'd be easier. You know what I mean? I wasn't doing the sentence. I didn't want to do it. So he, he said, I'll try for you. Now, what he didn't realise was they gave me all the paperwork back and I, I actually got his report back as well. And he said, I would not recommend this man for a CCAT in 100 years. You know what I mean? He, he definitely wants to escape and he's still a danger to the public. So I got refused to see Cat. When I got the parole, they called me down. I'm playing cards with a couple of guys upstairs. I get called on the tenor. I come down to the office. There's about six screws in the office, including me personal officer and the governor. And they were all looking grim-faced. I'm thinking someone's fucking died outside. <laughs> so I've come in, Smith. Uh, I've had a notification from the home office from the parole board. I've, I forgot all about it. Oh, have you? Yeah. Um, you're granted parole. You'll be leaving on Thursday. Have they got it? Yeah. They were absolutely sick. I turned around to my personal officer. I said, see that sea cat stick it up your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they were like, they were terrible, you know. Can you imagine you got your sea cat and then you escaped and then yeah. fucking two days later, oh, you're getting released anyway. Would have been worse. But I got out and went straight back at it. Yeah. You know, straight well, away. I didn't go straight away. No, I decided this time that Couple I was going to go straight away. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually about, um, I think it was about... Five weeks I stayed straight. I got a job as a road cleaner. Cleaner. Do you try and change your life then? Yeah. <clears throat> so I thought to myself, right, I don't want to go back to prison straight away. Um, and and really, let's try something else. You know, I had a family by then. I had kids. So the kids are growing up. And I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, let's try something else. So my brother worked for the council, for Lambeth Council, and he managed to get me a job as a road sweeper on the estates. And my take-home pay was £90 a week. £90 a week. I used to spend that on petrol, getting to a fucking bank to rub it, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I, I'm living on toasted carpet and cup of soup and shit, and I'm living in a bed seat that cost me £50 a week. And I'm just like, but I'm still trying, you know. Yeah. And it went on for a couple of months, and I'm out sweeping the estates. And then one day, I'm in a bad mood, and I'm sweeping this estate up in um, Stockwell. And there's a brand new, a bit of a dirty old rundown council estate, and there's a brand new, I think it was a Mercedes Sports parked in the car park and I thought I bet that belongs to some fucking gangster or a drug dealer on this estate so I swept all round bum 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 just about the wall away I'm looking at the car the guy comes down clicks open the car gets into the car glances at me takes a load of rubbish out of the car just throws it on the floor I thought I'm not fucking having that so I've gone over I said here mate I said uh, I'll clean this estate I said I've just swept there I said and put this stuff in the bin I said you've just thrown all that out of your car he went, so what? He said, you're a roast weaver. Fuck off. And that was it. I went, stand up. He's got out of the car. He went, what? Bang. Nutted him. He's gone down. Stamped on him a few times. Broke me broom over his head. <laughs> and then left me trolley there. Walked off. Got on the phone on the way back in the phone box. Phoned up me mate and said, any work about it? And he went, yeah. He said, 10 grand you'll wait tomorrow if you carry the gun. I went, sweet, I'll have it. And that was me back into the robbery. Do you think that's because you never had the, the power and the authority 
it's like being back in prison again where people are being cheeky and never seen you as because if you're doing banks if you're hanging about with the bad boys people are going to give you that authority and that yeah. wee bit of power that you are something what you think is respect yeah, I mean, that, yeah. that's, that's what I was, I was going, yeah a lot of people it is of course it is yeah but a lot of people think it's like oh it's a respect mm -hmm. thing and all that and it, you know people are disrespecting you and I was a bit like that and I, and I thought well, I'm not you know what I'm road sweeping again but I've just become another monk you know what I mean? For these people, they're just, it's just people want to abuse you all the time. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'm not having it. I'm not mm -hmm. having it. So crime was the way for me. And I formed a little team then, um, who they eventually the flying squad nicknamed us the laughing bank robbers. Um, and that was, uh, it was over, um, what happened was we robbed the bank on Christmas Eve. We used to do things, we used to enjoy our work. You know, mm. we'd, we'd try and have a laugh while we were doing it as well, even though it's <laughs> horrible. I know now. Yeah, I'm no, I'm laughing, terrible. but I know it's not funny, but because it's, you're saying it so calmly and Christmas yeah. Eve and... I, I know I shouldn't be laughing, but I find it funny because yeah. it, cause of the extent. It and is the funny on a different level, yeah. but it's kind of... When I think about it, it was fucking crazy. What we yeah. Doing, yeah. But we're, we're robbing this Midland Bank on Christmas Eve, my birthday. I mm -hmm. think if I can't get a bit of luck on my birthday, which I didn't <laughs> when I was trying to escape in 77. Anyway, so they, the banks are open till one o'clock on Christmas Eve. So the Midland Bank, and that was our favourite. Because there's more money in the banks at Christmas. Hey, eh? There's more money in the banks yeah, at oh, yeah, Christmas. Yeah, yeah, banks are packed at Christmas. And this one, we'd done this one because it was in Clapham, and the last time it had been robbed that we could find out was by Charlie Wilson, who was one of the great train robbers. He'd done it before the great train robbery, and he, he got away with about a thousand pounds or something back in the fifties. So we thought, yeah, we'll do that one. So we've gone in there, but as before we've gone in, there's a guy outside and he's selling Santa hats on the pavement, a pound each. So I said, it's three of them. We had a getaway driver and three of us were going in. So I said, get three of them hats. So when we put a ski mask on, we put the Santa hats on over the top of them. Went into the bank, ho, 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 giving it all that. <laughs> you know, they're terrified. Smashed the screen through, jumped over the counter, nicked the money, coming out with a sacks, Merry Christmas, and all that as we're going out the, out the door. We think it's really funny. So then our next, and the, and the flying squad nicknamed us in the paper the Laughing Bank Robbers. So we thought, what else can we do that's funny? So my pal went, listen, they've got a training school in Hendon, police training school. Let's go over and do the, do the Midland Bank in Hendon, which is their bank. So we said, yeah, yeah. So we drove over there, and sure enough, we robbed the Hendon Midland Bank, and the police all come out of college in their shirt sleeves, chasing the car up the road to try and catch us. But, um, yeah, that was quite, you know, we, we used to do things that, so we could have a laugh as well. Even though we're terrifying and traumatising people, we, you know, at the end of the day, we didn't care. We were greedy, lazy fuckers yeah. who just wanted the money and we just wanted a laugh. But do you think we that, knew yeah. that we weren't going to kill no one. Do you think that was your way of coping with life as well, with all the trauma and pain you went through? Yes. A coping yeah. mechanism. As, and was. people might not understand that, but people deal with things differently because the angriest men also are the weakest. If you we can portray fear and that keeps yeah. people away because we are hot with trauma or we have got demons that doing that stuff is kind of we surround ourselves with people who's got the same pain you probably notice now that the people who you did the banks we've probably had the same trauma they did, and upbringing yeah. that you had yeah. do you know what I mean so that's a coping mechanism we had to keep ourselves laughing yeah. because as you say it's the fear as well you know yeah. if you're going out frightened to do something you're going to make mistakes and you know so you've got to be calm and the way we done it was with humour that was our coping mechanism you know we, we we're all good friends we're all close friends and we'd have jokes and that when we were out there, you know, like we went and robbed the Allied Irish Bank in Cricklewood Broadway because I was going to Dublin to see my family. And we all went in with Belfast accents. And the funny thing was this. We're, we're calling each other number one and number two and number three. Have you got that there, number one? Get that there for the cause. <laughs> and all that. This is what we're saying to the mm -hmm. cashiers. When I eventually get nicked for these robberies, about a year later... Some of the witnesses that come up the old Bailey, two of them from the Allied Irish Bank, two women, said in their statements that number one, who was me, was definitely from a certain part of Derry because they recognised the accent. I'd never been to Derry in my life. But both of them, two separate women, recognised an accent from, I think, it was South Derry or somewhere. And they were adamant about it. So I'm thinking, that's my way out. I haven't got a fucking Derry accent, you know what I mean? It didn't work. But... <laughs> But yeah, I mean, um, what's the craziest we, robbery you've ever did? Like dressed up wise and masked, like a 
You ever dressed up as some some like a woman or anything to get into a bank? And... No, I tell you what, I was for a while though. The newspapers when I was doing them on my own when I was on the run, they were calling me the city gent because I used to dress in a suit, Hugo Boss suit, bowler hat, carry a briefcase, and go in and just a pair of glasses and just open up my briefcase on the counter, take the shotgun out, and go right fill the briefcase. So in the papers, they were calling me the city gent. Um, but the funniest, some of the funniest things happen when you're doing robbery that you cannot account for. I was doing one one day, and my mate's filling the bag, and I've got about 20 people up against the wall of a bank, and I've got a shotgun, and I'm like, that. hurry up, hurry up. A mask there, right, standing in front of them. And I noticed that one of the fellas who had his hands up had a, a really nice watch on, a Rolex. So I've gone to him, oi. <laughs> so he's looked over me, yeah. They're a Rolex. So he went, yeah, it is. I went, is it a real one? He went, yeah. Well, let's have a look. And he's got to take it off. I went, don't take it off. I said, just show me it. So he's turned it around and he's trying to talk. I said, I don't want your fucking watch, mate. I'm here to rob the bank. You know what I mean? I don't want your watch, <laughs> which I didn't. You know, I, didn't, I wasn't there to rob people. I was there to rob the actual institution. I can't believe a stupid bastard said that. Yeah, other says no. Yeah. But another funny one, I've had loads of funny ones. I walked into um, a bank up in Fort Neath when I'd done the free in the day and I went, right, everybody on the floor. Everybody went on the floor, about like 10 people. And one guy's still standing there, a black fella still standing at the counter, like with his arm on the counter, looking at me. I went, did you hear me, mate? I said, get on the floor. He went, I'm a yardy. He said, I don't get on the floor for no one. <laughs> just walked up. I went, get on the fucking floor. I'll blow your head off. And he went, all right, I didn't think you were serious. <laughs> Another time I've walked in, on my own again, pulled the shotgun out and pulled out a plastic bag, threw it towards the counter and went, fill that meaning the cashiers, there's a guy on the other side, on the, on my side of the counter, a customer, takes the bag and starts emptying his pockets into it. I went, not you, for fuck's sake, give it to the cashier. <laughs> when I get the money away and I pull the bag out, there's a comb, a bus ticket, <laughs> like three pence in change and all sorts of weird shit. Another time, uh, robbing on my own again, up in Streatham, I walked in, had the shotgun, uh, I had a rifle, a two-two rifle cut down, overcoat on, I've walked in, I went, right, and I'm trying to pull it out of my coat, and it's caught with my coat. Everybody up the end of the bank, so about 20 people have gone to the end of the bank, quite far away, and it was all marble floors. So I eventually went like that, and as I pulled it, the gun slipped out of my hands, and the rifle has slid all the way across the floor. They're standing there like that, and it's landed at geezer's foot. And I, I don't know what to do now, and I'm standing there like that, and I went, kick that back. And he went, all right. <laughs> <laughs> He's kicked it straight back. And have I picked it up? Yeah, I've picked it up and I went, right. So that's it. And another time, I've got, I've, there were so many of them. I've got into a, a bank in Croydon and I've got all the people up against the wall and all the cashiers have ducked down behind the counter. So I'm shouting to them through the, through the hatch, through the, the, the hatches. And I'm going, if you don't come up here and start putting the money up, with him, the count of three, I'm going to start fucking killing your customers one by one. And I've heard from all the customers. <gasps> and I've looked over them, I went, like that. And they're all like that, looking at me. But these can't see me, the yeah, cashiers. Yeah, yeah. They're down behind the counter. I said, one, two, and, and the customers are all like that. I went, three. I said, see you lot. You're a bunch of fucking wankers. And I said, see you lot. I said, don't bank with these people no more. They let you get killed for three grand behind the counter. And I just walked out. Mm -hmm. But what's the mess you've ever had out of a bank? Um, I think it was 48 grand. We used to do a thing called the um, the reserve game. We knew someone, this is why we robbed Midland Banks, because we knew someone who had a relative in a Midland Bank who was giving us information, but they didn't know they were giving us information, if you know what I mean. And they told us, we found out that what the Midland Bank done, instead of robbing the security van, which most people do, Wait till the security van delivers and the cash goes into the monthly cash goes into the cashier safe underneath the counter because the vault's on a time lock. And that has got a key. So if you can get them to open that, you know, you can get the money over the counter. That's what we used to do. Wait for the van to go straight in. Who's the head cashier? Now they're not expecting it. Yeah. I am. <laughs> open that fucking safe under there and give me the money. They're shocked that you know. Boom, you're getting packets of money out, sealed up. That has just been delivered by a security court. Was there any was there any jobs you look at and think I'd love to have been on that job, like the great train robber there, the Brinks, or uh, you'd like to have been involved in? They all kind of ended in, in in sadness, really. I mean, when you look at all those big jobs that yeah. that were committed, the by, bigger the job, the more chance of getting caught. Exactly, except for one one job that was absolutely fantastic. It was planned by Billy Hill. 
who used to be the king of the underworld, 1952. It's called the East Castle Street Post Office Robbery. Roy Shaw was involved. Um, he got away. Everyone got away. They robbed the post office van of, I think it was £238,000 in cash in 1952, which is the equivalent of Money about is. £17 million pounds yeah. a day. And they got clean away. They had a fight with the police, got clean away, and the home office, like Winston Churchill was the home secretary, and every day he wanted a report on what was happening with his East Castle Street post office robbery. Nobody ever got nicked for it. You know what I mean? And that was it. It was the biggest robbery ever, and no one even got... It's only now, these days, that people know who was on it. You know what I mean? Nobody knew at the time. But that was Billy Hill. He was a master planner, yeah. you know? It's got to be well planned. It's not just a case of... You've kamikazed a few. Yeah. Where you've been in yourself. Why did you do a lot yourself? I've done them because I loved the buzz. And it's, I'll, I'll give you an example. I came out of Wandsworth. I'd done three months in Wandsworth um, for possession of a bullet. They found a bullet in me, uh, in my house. So I've done three months. And I'm getting out, and, and, and I, they said, I didn't have no money. So they said, there's no discharge grant for you. So I said, why? And they said, well, paperwork's been fucked up. You'll have to go down to the Social Security, which is just down the road. So I went, all right. So I walked into Social Security, and I, and I went, listen, I've just come out of prison. There's the paperwork. I said, oh, they've got no money for me. And he went, uh, he said, you only live up in Brixton? The guess behind again? I said, yeah. He said, well, your discharge grant is like to get you home and that. He said, it's only a bus ride away. I went, all right, keep your money. Walked outside, swear to God, two doors along, there's a bin with a McDonald's bag in it. I take the McDonald's bag out, empty it out, get me scarf, wrap it around my face, put my hand into the McDonald's bag, walk into a building society that's on the same road, and went, give me the money. Boom, they put seven grand on the counter. Off I've gone, happy as Larry. But I had this thing where I had a real sort of need to do it, if you know what I mean. I needed to affirm that, you know, that I was actually in control of things. Well, I wasn't. My life was spiralling out of control all the time, but I had to believe that was I was Was there drink or drugs involved at that, this time? Never. never. We, we had this thing amongst us like that we would never commit a, a serious crime whilst under the influence of drink or drugs. It wasn't professional, you know what I mean? And we kind of classed ourselves as, as professionals. Well, as kind of professional because a lot of people don't do anything sober. Majority of people... I know a lot of bank robbers and, and people like that who would have a nip or a snort yeah, coke or something. Yeah, even to a, get that buzz because yeah. it's a fear in it. They're, they're yeah. scared. And the majority of people who I've spoke to who's been in prison were wrecked. We're, mm. we're on something. We're intoxicated. No, we either drink or drugs. We were going to a robbery one day and we had a guy with us who was a new fella who we hadn't worked with before. And he's in the back of the car with a mate of mine. I'm in the front. My mate's driving. And suddenly I, in the back of the car, I've looked round. He's snorting coke off a night. What are you doing? He went, uh, he said, I'm just having a bit of a live now. He said, do you want one? I went, stop the car, get him out. He went, what? I said, get the fucking gun back, piss off. Lay about it. Yeah, don't want him on a road. What if he shoots somebody? I'm going away for the rest of my life, you know what I mean? You cannot put your life in other people's hands without some sort of element of control. And that's what I was always after, an element of control. I never had no control over my life. So to me, this was a false control, you know what I mean? I could, if I could do certain things that I could stick to, like a routine, then I was okay. It's a bit like being autistic. Yeah. But I am a psychopath, so it's kind of, yeah. and I've been diagnosed as a psychopath. Mm -hmm. So I, I suppose it's part of that, you know what I mean? It's part of you need a routine and you, you're ruthless. You don't really... Yeah. So for the, after the 27 years... You, you did a living, you're trying to change your life, you get back into crime, yeah. but then your second strike rule, where you eventually got life. Yeah. What robbery was that? Uh, that was a series, that was the laughing bank robberies. Mm -hmm. uh, the Christmas uh, ones? Bank robbers. Yeah, we, we, I got done for eight armed robberies and um, eight lots of um, possession of firearms and ammunition. Um, I was on my own, the rest of them never got caught. And I got caught down to, um, and, and you know, I'm not lying, planted DNA. That's the only way they could get me. Mm -hmm. And that's a fact. I didn't even wear the gloves they found supposedly with my blood in them. I didn't even wear those gloves. They weren't my gloves. They were my pals. They just knew it was you. No, how they done? What they done was this. They knew I was at it. Yeah, I'm on the sure, flying yeah, I'm on the flying squad's wanted list. When they're from our orders, probably still now. But so they're keeping an eye out everywhere, and they know we're move, mooching about, and I'm mixing with other people who are armed robbers. So what they done was when they've eventually nicked me, I'm, they nicked me on, a, on another kamikaze one. A couple of your pals went out to Costa Rica. I decided I'd go down and rob a local bank um, in the summer. Walked in, got an exploding dye pack, didn't realise, come out, set light, 
exploded and set light to me. And they caught me down to that. Now, what happened was they, they got me for that, but I had an excuse for that, which is the only the only defence for robbery is duress, and that's the defence I run on that. They wanted me for the other seven robberies. They knew I'd been involved, but they couldn't prove it. So what they'd done was I said to my brief when I first got nicked, I said, they're up searching my flat. I said, I had hair then. I said, make sure they don't take my comb and plant evidence because, like, ski masks were dumped after some of the robberies. So he went, no, I'm on that. So they come back to the police station and they said, um, um, we need to take your DNA. It had never been taken. So I said, they said, do you want to take a swab of blood? So my brief went, he'll take blood. There was no blood on any of the robberies, was there? I went, no, he'll take blood. So like that. So they've took the blood. Anyway, about eight weeks later, they come up to Belmarsh Prison, charged me with the other seven robberies, I reckon they found a speck, a minute speck of my blood inside one of the surgical gloves that was dumped after a robbery in Clapham, uh, along with a gun, and that it was 800,000 to one that it, that it wasn't mine, that it was mine, or however they work it. Now, I knew it weren't my blood, They and I, it took me ages to figure out how they'd done it, and then I met a fella inside who was in for murder, and he'd been nicked by the same copper. And I said, we're chatting away, and he, I said, how'd they get here? He went, he said, this funny thing, he said, they got a speck of my blood. So me and him are thinking, how the fuck are we both nicked on the same evidence by the same copper? And eventually we worked it out. What they done was, when they come to take the blood, they clean out the, the bin in the police station, the sterile bin. Mm-hmm. Doctor comes in, he takes your blood, he does two um, pots, one that you're allowed to have tested, one that they have mm-hmm. tested, and then he throws the syringe into the bin, and off he goes. And what they do is they come in afterwards, take the syringe out, and there's obviously a little tiny bit of blood and a minute expect that they can then plant onto something. And I met six or seven cases in jail over the next five years who'd been nicked by the same police squad and had the same evidence against them. Fuck I thought this was mental. bastards. Yeah. So they, they got me by that. And I pleaded not guilty because I thought, yes, I've done the robberies, but if you're going to cheat, mate, <laughs> then I'm, I ain't yeah. going to stick my hands up to mm-hmm. them. It ain't happening. So I had a trial at the Old Bailey. And um, the first trial, the jury couldn't agree. The police come in and they were proved to be lying about nearly everything. <coughs> and what happened was, when the, ju- the judge called the, the jury in after four days and he said, look, he said, if I was to give you till Friday, this now Wednesday, he said, could you reach a verdict on any of the 16 counts? He said, just answer yes or no. And the foreman went, not if we say it till Christmas. And the judge went, a simple yes or no would have done. So he said, right, I've got to, uh, he said, I've got to dismiss the case, he said, um, uh, and charge a retrial. So I thought, great, you know, the evidence is absolutely crap. Yeah. Had me retrial two weeks later, like an idiot, instead of waiting a few months for the dust to settle. And by then the police had ironed out all the kinks in their evidence, never called the cobblers they called the last time. Mm-hmm. And um, I got convicted within, I think it was, I think it was 20 minutes. The first jury were out for five days, the second jury were out for 20 minutes. And my second jury were 10 middle-aged women and two geezers who never looked up in the whole time of the, the, the trial, never even looked at me. But here's the funny thing. There was a bird on the jury who looked the image of Fred West. Right? I swear to God, I thought it was Fred West. And she was sitting down the front. Now, I noticed her looking at me. And the trial went on for a while. So every day I used to come in and wink and smile at her and she'd wink and smile at me. So I said to me, brief, I've got a bird on the jury. So he said, all you need is one more, you're walking. So every morning it was, how you doing? <laughs> you know, I had hair then, you know, white teeth and everything. I was, I was a bit of a catch. Mm-hmm. And this bird was all, Woo-hoo-hoo. anyway, come the end of the trial, they said, uh, have you got a foreman, four person? He said, I think, oh my God. So she stands up. So he says, on count one, any count, I'm going to prison for life. On count one, do you find the defendant guilty or not guilty? She went, guilty. <laughs> and looked at me and didn't say, you yeah, <laughs> And then it was guilty for the whole lot, mm-hmm. for the whole 16. So I've got eight life sentences and eight lots of 10 years concurrent for the forest. Fucking hell. How long did you serve out of that then? Well, it, it was brand new at the time. It was two strike, what they called the two strike life. And I got the highest two strike tariff given out ever. Um... Uh, which was 12 years, and I appealed against him. Brief, but I've sat down with me QC under, underneath the old bailey, and I've known him, Jim Sturman, since well, since I was a kid, you know, since he was a junior barrister. And I said to him, Jim, be honest. I said, do you think I'll get out ever on this? 
He just looked at me, he went, to be honest, he said, no, I don't. he said, not with your previous, he said, I can't see, he said, it's a new sentence, I can't see you ever getting out. He said, this is your life. They thought you were in forever? Yeah, he said, you've got a 12-year tariff, he said, even if you do the 12-year tariff, he said, you're going to do like at least eight or 10 years over that. He said, and look at the age of you now. So I said, all right, thanks for being uh, honest with me. He said, but I'll tell you what, he said, if you do get a hearing, he said, I'll come and do it for nothing, even if I'm a judge in 10 years' time. And he did. He stuck to his word, fair play to him. But um, I thought my life was over. That was it, you know. And, and I, I, I said, prison is now my life. Did you accept cut, it? Yeah, I cut off my ties with everyone outside. Too hard for you to speak to people? Yeah. You can't live in prison and, and outside at the same time. I always tell people that. If you have connections with outside. And my, you know, I love my family and I love my kids, but I didn't want them being dragged into prisons, especially prisons like Belmarsh and Whitemore where they really sort of humiliate families in some cases, you know, make them strip and all that, or turn them away and say, like, the dog sat down on you when it's obviously not true. So I didn't want none of that. But uh, I still kept in touch with my family by phone. By now, prisons had phones, you know, you could use. Um, I ended up two years in Bel- in Belmarsh, and uh, then they shipped me out to Whitemore, which was, like, it still is, I suppose, the most top security jail in Europe. Um, and I'm in Whitemore for a while, and this is what really made me change my life. This was the whole the, the whole crux of my story. Is this? Um, I'm there for about a year, and in 2001, um, I've done. I got sentenced in '99, so I've done a couple of years. Anyway, I'm cut. Whenever you see a priest or or an imam or a you know a vicar or whatever in jail on the landings, you know there's bad news for someone. And I'm coming back from tea one day uh, with a, a big. Uh, drug dealer, big Geordie drug dealer called Bud. And me and him were having a laugh, all getting onto the spur. And I look up and I see a priest up at the end by my cell. And I don't think he's at my cell. And I've gone about someone's him for a bit of bad news. And he went, hey. And off we've gone. So I've walked up there and he's waiting outside my cell. And he went, are, are you Noel Smith? And I went, no. And I've gone into the cell. I don't want to hear what he's got to say. I know it's bad. It can only be someone's died outside. So he said, you are Noel Smith. He said, I've got some news from outside, some bad news to tell you. I went, listen, go away from me. I said, don't talk to me, go away, fuck off, and slammed my door on him. He went and got the screws to open the door, and they said, look, we have to tell you, um, your son Joseph, who was 19, uh, was found dead last night outside. So Sorry I went, I said, no, I said, I'm not having it. I don't believe you, fuck off, I'll wake myself, I'll knock you out. And eventually, after about 10 minutes of bang-up, I thought, I've got to get on the phone and, and see if my wife is, is, knows about this. They're obviously trying to play head games with me. Get on the phone, it's true. I was devastated. Um, yeah, it kind of uh, it brought it home to me, you know what I mean? I, 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 I'm sitting in a prison and, uh, and I'm helpless, you know what I mean? So, anyway, they said they said they'd let me go to the funeral. It was kind of a standard thing to let you go to your kid's funeral or a close relative's funeral, even though I was a lifer in a, in a Category A prison, and I was Category A. And um, eventually the, the vicar, the, the priest said, yeah, he said, I don't see there'd be any trouble you going to the funeral. And everyone was all coming down and, like, commiserations and all that. And I went up in front of the security governor the next day, and it turned out that the security governor... I knew the security governor from Ballstall, I'd actually broken his mate's jaw, another screw, when they were younger screws, and he didn't like me at all. And um, I had to stand in front of him, and they said, uh, you want to go to your son's funeral? I said, yeah. And they went, well, beg for it. I went, what? He said, beg. So I said, look, I want to go to my son's funeral. Can I please go? And they went, no. He said, I couldn't. He said, I wouldn't let you out anyway. He said, but I can't take the risk of having you out there with all your family. He said, my officers might get hurt, blah, 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 your category A. And um, I was just devastated. I just went back to my cell um, and I just, I didn't know what to do. And eventually a mate of mine, um, a Dublin fella, a Dublin drug dealer who was doing 20 years come down and he went, listen, he said, he said, my wife died about three years ago. He said, you know they have to take you to the chapel arrest. He said, it's a legal requirement if they don't let you go to the funeral. So I said, I didn't know that. So he's gone, come on with me. Boom, gone up, said, listen, I want to go to the chapel arrest. And the governor couldn't refuse. He had to let me go. So they got eight screws, threw me in a van, took me down to Malden, 
took me into the chat. Lucky enough, my wife knew I was coming and she had the, the other kids there. And I had to go in, chain to a screw, um, to see my dead son uh, in the funeral home. Is and that I the tried, first time you'd seen your family yeah, as well? Yeah. And I bent down to kiss his forehead and the screw tried to pull me back up again. I've just pulled him. It was just so disrespectful, you know what I mean? And I, I, I eventually went back to the prison and, and the guys at the jail and a lot of hard men, you know, proper really fucking faces, come to me and said, it's out of order, I'm not letting you go to the funeral. Jeffrey Archer's just gone to his mother's funeral. He got sentenced three days ago, seven years. Didn't even have handcuffs on. Um, so there was a plan then to like in Whitemore prison that we were going to get our own back on the screws and they were going to bash the screws and we was, it was going to be a riot situation. And I thought, yeah, good. But thinking about it overnight, I thought, well, I don't want that to be the legacy my son leaves behind, you know what I mean? Me nicked again, end up like Charlie Bronson. Yeah, not <coughs> um, getting out. So yeah, think, I'll never get out. Uh, so do you think that was a turning point then? It was. was it was. Tragic, not right at, at, right at that is, moment, yeah. yeah. I, over the next couple of months, I really had, I, I grieved a lot and I had to work out in my own head what I was going to do. And I thought to myself, do you know what, just for once, I'm going to try and find rehabilitation in prison. Let's give it a chance and see if it works. Because I'm thinking, I've lost my son, he's 19. I've got other kids out there. What if one of them dies, you know what I mean? So... I looked around, and the only rehabilitation I could actually find in the prison system was a prison called Grendon in Buckinghamshire, which is um, which is based on uh, therapy, group therapy, and you have to volunteer to go there, and they have to test you to see if you've got the IQ to understand the therapy in the first place. Mm-hmm. There's no point giving you like a couple of years of therapy if you don't understand it. So I applied for that. I had to see a psychiatrist, you know, and uh, have drug tests, and and I had to do a, an IQ test. And eventually they accepted me in Grendon and I went down and I, was, I ended up spending five years in there doing the, like intense... Working therapy. on yourself? Yeah. Is that the first yeah. time you accepted that, okay, I need help? It was, yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I, I resisted it even there for a while, you know. It was, there was still part of the old prison head in me that Grendon was like a weakling's nick. It was for people who were like giving up and, you know, people in the system would take the piss out of it. It's a lot of ego involved. There is, yeah. It's a lot of ego that they don't think... Or you're weak, but that's strength. Anybody who wants to get help, anybody who wants to change, is strength. Yeah. In my in my eyes. So when you eventually started working on yourself, because I know we've had a laugh and we've laughed at some stuff, but yeah, you've robbed 200, 200 banks. You've spent over thirty years in prison. Mm-hmm. But let's not take away the fact that you fucking changed. You learned yeah. how to read and write in prison, and now you've wrote seven books. Seven books. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Now you're you're working. Now you see your family. You're doing good things. After all those years, so I always say it, no matter how old you are, no matter how fucked up your past is, people can change. You're a prime example with that. So when you started changing and started making the moves to better your life and get a better understanding that, listen, what you did was wrong. There's yeah, not a taking away yeah. from the fact that what you did was wrong, but when you started changing, how did you? How was your mindset then? Did you start to feel better? Did you start to distance yourself from the friends who you were in prison with? No. At first, I mean, the first say a year I felt worse because I did distance myself from from people in prison I was still writing to a few people you know because people were happy for me to go there whereas some people would have got a, a lot of stick for it in Whitemore when I told people I was going to Grendon they was going good luck I hope something happens and so but what happened was the, the first year brought up a lot of really bad shit in me I mean I never kind of took on the notion that I had victims of my crimes. Well, all armed robbers are the same. They get together and they say, well, if you don't hurt anybody, you're not doing anything. All you're doing is putting like a penny on interest rates. Fuck the banks. They got plenty of money. You know what I mean? You're not killing anyone. I'm selfish. Yeah. You're not robbing old age pensioners or fiddling with kids. So you kind of build yourself up into this kind of like as though you're a folk hero, yeah, you like cre- you're Robin Hood. Yeah. You create that lie. So it yeah. makes it easier it for you to do It makes it easier that. for you to yeah. accept it. Yeah. And you never see your victims. That's the thing is when, if, when you go and do stuff like that, People are cardboard cars. You make them into cardboard cars because if you thought about them as human beings, you wouldn't be able to do what you're doing. So ordering people around at the point of a gun, shouting at people and all that and threatening people is easy if you don't see them as human. It's how the Nazis got away with it, you know what I mean? And it's kind of the same mindset. You look at them as just people in your way, in the way of what you're doing, and they don't really matter. And this is what really done me. I had no empathy. And my first year in Grenham was all about victims. And they kept on at me. 
how many victims do you think you've left behind? I, I, to me, I'm going, I haven't left no victims behind. I haven't shot anybody. I haven't like hit anybody over the head with a kosh. I haven't stabbed anybody in the banks. But then they, it kind of got to me that how many people, and people started saying, what about your family? They're your victims. They've been years without you. They do the sentence with you. Yeah, and it's tight coming into my head. And I was sitting there one day and I'm thinking, I, I just tried to work out how many people were in all these banks that I'd robbed over the years. And I just couldn't even count them. I'm thinking, in each bank, there's about 20 people and about five cashiers. Yeah, so thousands of people. Know, yeah, and I, I'm thinking, how the hell am I going to make amends for all that? And I can't. And I finally accepted. I done so, a thing they call psychodrama. I avoided it for three years. And psychodrama is really a powerful tool if you get into it. And you reenact scenes in your life and things you know, that bothered you and things that changed you. But you're not a child. Yeah, and I reenacted my, getting beaten up by the screws when I was a kid. I reenacted, you know, my son's death and, and everything around it. It was the first time I was able to really, really grieve for him. I probably had a breakdown. But it took me five years. Grendon is supposed to be 18 months. You know, your stay at Grendon would be 18 months. And you should, if you're a normal sort of criminal, be able to grasp sort of the intricacies of what you've been doing and, and, and how to change by then. Five years it took me. I couldn't stop. I was, you know, it was like... That become your drug? Yeah. The, yeah, by the, like the a bank robbery? Yeah, yeah, I sort of started thinking I was a therapist by the end of it. <laughs> I'm starting to work people out. When new guys are coming on, I'm looking after people and I'm, I'm working out people as they're talking to me and I couldn't stop doing it. It was... Someone would go to me... They had certain buzzwords in, in Grenland, in all therapy, I think. How does that make you feel? You know, that was the, the main one. How does that make you feel? And you get sick of hearing it, but people always say it, or I'm in a bad space. What the hell does that mean, I'm in a bad space? I'm in a bad space at the moment, and I don't want to talk about it. But like, I started thinking, I can work people out now. I, because I'd been worked out, and I'd seen how they'd done it, I started thinking, well, I can do it with other people. Uh, you know, I'm thinking, well, I'm a fucking therapist here. I'm not a therapist at all. I was just a guy who went through therapy and it worked for me. And I liked it. So it sort of gave me such a buzz that I really wanted to spread it around to people. And even when I got out, I was still on the therapy buzz and I'm talking to people as though I'm in therapy. And people outside, they don't want to hear that crap. They don't want to hear, how does that make you feel and what no. space you're in? They're, they're like, let's go down the pub yeah. and have a drink, shut up. Yeah, but a lot of people are in denial. Yeah. You've you've faced all your fears and demons, and it's took you five years. Listen, you'll be facing your demons and fighting them to the day you die. I know. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah. the fact that you did, the fact that you did face them and work on them and, and looked at that trauma and looked at those things where getting bullied and the loss of your son, you've faced it. And instead of suppressing your feelings and emotions, especially in prison with some of the most... Big, the biggest criminals in the world, not just the UK, the world, they don't, they're not going to say, look, I feel sad or I feel weak or I need help. No. They ain't going to fucking say that. The fact that you did do that and the fact that you did get help, my heart, I take my heart off to you because it's massive, massive respect. And the right. fact that you, you learn how to read and write in there as well. How long, when you did your life sentence, did you do when you get out then? Well, I, I appealed against a 12-year tariff and they cut it to eight years and I ended up doing 12. Yeah. <laughs> so I got refused parole four times. But the, the good thing that came out of therapy was um, one of the things that you had to do was write your life story as a kind of a, a, a pointer of where you went wrong and, and sort of, you know, that sort of thing. And I, I, I wrote this, I started writing and I couldn't stop. It, it was just flowing out of me. I ended up writing something, I think it was about 900 pages of an autobiography over about a three-month period, six hours a day, every day in myself, typing away on a manual typewriter. People used to come to my door and go, you're coming on an association? I go, no. I'm open, but can you put me in your book? Yeah, of course I can. Don't worry about that. Boom. But I was just, it, I had to get it out of me. It was like an empty. Is that your therapy? Yeah, that yeah. was it. I had to empty everything out of me. And I, I put it all in there. And, and when it, I was friends with Will Self, I'd met him in 97 when I was out and I'd gone to a dinner party with him and John McVicker and I helped him out on a book he was doing. So he, he sort of took an interest in me and he would come up and visit me in Belmarsh and he said, look, he said, if you ever want to write, he said, I'll be your agent. He said, but I am not helping you unless you give up crime. He said, there's no point in me getting you a book deal and then the next week you're out robbing a bank and making a mug of me. He said, so when you're ready to give up crime, tell me and I will help you with your writing. And I did. After I'd written this, I'll give it to him and I said, look, and it was, mate, I'll tell you what it was. When my son died, I was really embarrassed as well, as well as everything else, because his funeral was quite expensive and my in-laws paid for it. And I hated my in-laws, 
right, at the time. I, not so much now. I don't, I get on all right <laughs> of them. But it was a bit of that old tribal yeah. stuff because my Played. wife was from a place called Porter Down in Ireland, which is mainly loyalist sort of paramilitaries. They're proper, you know, uh, and our uncles are all in that got a yeah, yeah, yeah. road march and all that turn out. And my family were sort of, low light republicans from the south you know they didn't really care about like so it was a rivalry kind of yeah and 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 it was mainly with her family because her family was staunch loyalists and i'm a take so according to them so they didn't want her with me in the first place now years later when my son dies and they pay for the funeral that that hurts me i've been robbing banks all my life i've had all this money i've wasted it and i can't even put a penny into my son's funeral so when i wrote the book i said will I said, look, there's, take that. I said, if you can sell that, I said, try and get me about three or four grand so I can give to my son to so I can pay them back for paying for my son's funeral. And within about two weeks, Penguin had took the book for quite a lot of money, more money than I'd probably nicked. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I just carried on writing from then, you know, yeah. and, and it just became a, it became a drug for me. Mm -hmm. And I was writing for this paper inside time, the prisoner's newspaper, from prison. Yeah, and I, I had loads of stuff published. I had a lot of poetry when I started out, short stories and stuff like that, and gradually learned the craft of writing and journalism. And um, I took a course with the London School of Journalism and done proofreading and uh, editing. And um, eventually, I went up for parole. Will Self came up um, to give evidence to the parole board for me in Blantyre House, and so did Jonathan Aiken, who I'd met in prison, the ex-Tory minister, and looked after him in jail and. Um, you know, he, he kind of come up and, and give me a good report yeah. and stuff like that. And eventually, after the fourth time of trying, they gave me parole. Yeah. How were you feeling the day you came out? It was kind of an anti-climax, to be honest yeah. with you. I mean, I, I got out and my dad and my brother were delighted, obviously. You know, they wanted to go out and go on the piss. And, and I didn't really feel like drinking or, you know, I just felt like just standing in Brixton High Street and just taking it all Enjoying in. Enjoying your know? freedom yeah. for once. Yeah. 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 And eating something that wasn't like a week old bread that wasn't hadn't been in the freezer for six months and stuff like that. I mean, little things really. But I had to live at me mum and dad's. They paroled me to me mum and dad's, so it was a bit kind of strange as well. Um, and eventually, I moved down here after a couple of months because the life that you've had, the life before you were sixteen, is enough misery and pain for mm -hmm. anybody to last a lifetime. Yeah. But the fact that you've came out, the fact that you've became a successful author, and the fact that you've won awards for writing columns for The Guardian, The Independent, mm -hmm. and even The Big Issue, yeah. it's unbelievable. Do you ever look back and go, okay, I had a fucking mental life, but I'm doing well for myself. Do you ever give yourself the appreciation that you deserved for making the changes and now helping other people? Sometimes. I, I, I kind of find it hard, you know. I, I I think to myself, if I hadn't gone all f through everything that I did go through, then I probably wouldn't have nothing to say. You know, who knows where I'd be. But then I think to myself, well, you know, I've been through all that and I'm able to come out of it and do something with it. And that, that's a bonus. Because let's face it, I mean, a lot of my mates who went to jail for long sentences, you'd be surprised how many people end up getting nutted off and end up in mental hospitals just through having a long prison sentence and they don't know what to do with them because people go a bit mad. Yeah. You've got 20 years to do and you're waking up every day looking at the same walls and yeah. looking at the same people. Did you lose a lot of friends in prison? Oh, yeah, yeah. So a lot of people died, yeah. Just yeah. old age. Oh, man, murder. At one stage, the British prison system, uh, the murder rate was seven times higher than it is in the outside world. So, you know, work that one out. In prisons like Albany and Parkhurst and that, you know, you didn't just fight people. You put people out of the game with hot water and sugar or stabbed them many times. And the violence you see every day, it, it kind of, it, you might as well be in a war zone. Yeah, you know I'm just I mean? about to say that. I it's lost that... a lot of friends and, and I lost a lot of friends to madness as well. They actually went crazy. Okay. And yeah, and, and off they went. I mean, one guy come out of his cell one day, a really lovely fellow I'd known since we were kids. Come out of his cell one day, wrapped up in a sheet with a Bible and a, a table leg, saying he was going to punish all the sinners. Ended up in a mental hospital. Yeah, you know, and this was the kind of thing you're dealing with every day. It's PTSD. Mad. Yeah, yeah. And you're all stuck in a cage. It's like mm. jails, like Whitemore. They call them spurs, but they're nothing but big cages with mm -hmm. seventy cells in, and you know, you're all in there in single cells, and they open the doors in there, and you can wander the cage, but the screws are outside the cage, kind yeah. of thing. If you know what I mean. Who kind of who was the maddest person you were in prison with? Oh, Charlie Bronson. No yeah, we're in Char love, with Charlie. I love Charlie. A lot of people don't like him, but I found him very, very funny. 
I'm still in touch with him to a certain extent today, but he he was kind of the, the reason I like Charlie Bronson um, back in the early days. Not so much now. I mean, I still like him. He's a nice guy. I wouldn't like him living next door to me, that's for sure. But and I've had him living next door to me in a block in Idown. But um, he was kind of like where in the eighties, where the screws had complete control of the prison system before strange ways. Jails like Wandsworth from Brixton, the screws were brutal, and I mean absolutely brutal. And to see Charlie Bronson strolling through a prison with eight screws running after him and him just marching along, like within him opening the doors and trying to get out of his way before, because that's what he used to do, just a pair of boots and a prison raincoat. He was kind of our guy, you know what I mean? He was our... Not, I wouldn't say hero, but he was our tool against the prison system. You know, he was actually knocking screws up in the air and knocking them out. And 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 if when we done it, we was getting half killed. You know, what I mean, so he was kind of a bit of a hero. To me. How much could how true is it that he could fight? He could scrap, Charlie. He could have a good route. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say he was Superman. Mm-hmm. You know, and, uh, what I found in jail is um, a lot of people who you think might be sort of invulnerable or they've got a reputation of being so hard you can't even they're not really that I mean everybody's human everybody's got their own weaknesses Witnesses, yeah I used to see I used to the bodybuilders used to hate me I was 19 stone at one time I was in training all the time but what I used to do was all the bodybuilders we used to call them buddy syndrome because they stand in front of the mirror in the gym looking at themselves and that and you know the worst way to hurt them you said, oh, yeah, all right, George, how are you doing? Yeah, you lost a bit of weight. <laughs> and that's it, they're gone. Yeah. What, what do you mean, lost weight? Well, 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 from where? And frighten the life out of them, you know what I mean? But yeah, I was, um, you know, prison wasn't, it, it, it was hell, but it was kind of hell with islands of boredom, if you like, and, and, and a, a few times when things weren't too bad. But on the whole, it was just like, it was a waste of life. It really was. It taught me nothing. And that's for anybody watching and listening that it is a life of crime doesn't pay. It doesn't no, pay. It's it a misery. Doesn't. It it goes with it all round. Not just mm. the families who are the victims, but it's also your own family. Mm. But the fact that you have changed your life and the plans for you going f- in the future because you're saying you're and writing another two books just now, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm writing two books at the moment. I'm writing one with my mate Andy, and um, it's called Green Bloods, which is, and it's about the sort of Irish influence on criminality in England uh, since the potato famine. And it, it starts off, actually, with um, the birth of the hooligan. The word hooligan actually comes from an Irish fellow who settled in Southwark, a family called the Hoolahans, but the English called them hooligan, and they would go about bashing people up and like causing uproar everywhere. So we go from there, right up through everything, Billy Hill, uh, the British brothers, you know, criminals that people maybe haven't heard so much about as well, like Eddie the German, uh, Jimmy the Danger Burn. Who the fuck said Eddie the German? He was my cousin, Eddie was the he? German, yeah. What, uh, he was one of the biggest uh, buyers of stolen goods and suppliers of firearms in this country at one time and stolen cars. His cars used to go to Glasgow, everywhere. Ringers, Porsches and stuff like that. He's dead now. But, um, you know, people like that, it, Jimmy Jimmy the Danger is another funny one. He's, he? he's been a millionaire a thousand times. He's, <laughs> he got his name because he was a Gaelic football player and he was nicknamed the Danger. And they reckon if you've got a score against him, like you, you've done well to do it. But, I mean, he was a massive drug smuggler. He was just one of them guys who he used to wear glasses on a bit of string around his neck. He was like an old teddy bear, but cross him, <laughs> and, and, that, and that was it. But a funny guy as well, you know? Yeah, everybody's funny in, in their own crazy way, I guess. Yeah. But now you're, you're out, you're out in license. You're, you're out in license for the rest of your life. Yeah. How is it? How is that affecting you? Because any sort of breach, because you've been out 10 years, which is fair play to you. That's the longest you've been out since you were 14. Yeah. Um, do you, are you in a good place? I am, yeah. I'm, I'm a bit... Content? Yeah. I got married since I got out. The only the only thing is, I've, I've seen so many deaths since I got out, family and friends, you know, all the old... My mum died uh, two years after I got Sorry out. Sorry to hear that. I was really pleased that she had a chance to see me out because it was always a wish all through her life. She was always like, you know, you've got to get out and stay out. And I used to tell her when I got out this time, mum, this time I'm out, you know, that's that's it, I'm finished. And, and after about a year and I hadn't gone back, she's kind of started believing me. And I'm glad she kind of, we had a chance to have some time together, you know. My dad's still alive. Um, but I've lost a lot of friends since I've been out. And I, and I also... I've kind of blanked a lot of people who I used to have in my old life, you know, because you can't really afford to be hanging around with people 
who have still got those negative attitudes, the only way to really sort of consolidate any sort of um, rehabilitation is to keep away from your old life. Don't go back there. I mean, I get the same thrill that I used to get out of walking into a banking hall with a shotgun from writing. You know, that's the good thing about it. Writing has filled that void for me. I write every day on the paper, you know, and and in the evening when I come, I'm then writing two books. So, you know, it's... it's, uh, Focused your energy onto something positive to keep going. But this is probably one of my best podcasts, if I'm honest. No, yeah, it's been fucking phenomenal. It's been phenomenal from your life and what you've been involved in. The story before you were 16... I've never heard a story like that. Really? Yeah, never heard it. And I've spoke to some fucking dangerous people. Mm. Your story is um, is phenomenal, and it's the would you, it's one of the best podcasts there for. It's um, nice. for what you've been through and what you're doing now to make changes. Do you go to prisons and speak? No, I do. Yeah, yeah I heard yeah, that. Yeah, and yeah. giving people advice and yeah. try to give them. There's tools and techniques. Yeah, to I always talk down. to them about writing. I, yeah. I love talking to young offenders about mm-hmm. writing as well because it's something they can do while they're in prison and prepare for when they get out. Yeah. It's no good going in and talking. To, a lot of kids say things like this. I say, the first thing I ask them, what are you in for? How long are you doing? So you get a kid, I'm, I'm doing five years, I'm in for dealing cannabis or whatever. Why should I give up crime? That's what they always say. I earn two grand a week when I'm dealing cannabis. I say, how much are you earning now? Seven pound a week. <laughs> and how long are you going to be earning that for? Five years, mate. So, you know, do something different with your life. Change now while you're Because can. everybody's an entrepreneur. Even yeah. if you're selling drugs, you've got the entrepreneurial skills to make money. Exactly. Let's just try to focus that and doing something productive. Yeah, put it in yeah, something else. because I've clearly got those skills. So is there anything you'd like to finish up on, though? Yeah, I mean, I'd like, um, really, uh, my, my, my main job on the paper is is, is really to sort I do interviews with people, um, every issue, with people who've got out of prison and have kind of stayed out and made something of their lives. And I, and I think that's a good thing. We need more encouragement for people in jail, more rehabilitation and education, which is the key to rehabilitation, which I've found myself. Yeah. But I'd like, you know, people inside not to give up. Like, I give up for 20, 30 years and just thought that was my life. It's not your life, mate. You can do what you want to do, you know what I mean? I say that to my kids now as well, you know. It's kind of like, you know, if you've got the will to do something with your life then and you get enough breaks, then you can do it. And, I, you know, I hope people take that sort of a face value and don't think that I'm trying to preach to them. But, you know, prison's no good to anybody. Everyone thinks that a crime is a life of glamour. And to a certain extent, it is for about 10 minutes, but it's not glamorous when you're laying in some punishment block with like blood coming out your ears and you're covered in vomit and you're in a a straitjacket, you know, then it ceases to be fun. And I think people should realise that and, you know, realise that they can do something else. You're not a loss just because you've been to prison. You can do something. Yeah, because you're in prison as well. You've got a diploma. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and in London get, School of Journalism. Yeah. I've got an A-level in law, and I got that in order to fight the prison system, so I know what I was saying. <laughs> so I know what I was talking about. Uh, did you think now to move on, you, you kind of released all your pain and anxiety and kind of to accept and kind of, it's difficult as well, but to release and kind of forgive? I don't know. I, 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 I've got no hatred of the yeah. police. I've got no hatred of the, pri- the prison system. I have got hatred of the system itself. Yeah, because it's both his feel. Yeah, yeah, the staff. Um, I met some decent staff in jail, even though the majority of the staff I met in there were proper dogs. Um, I mean, there are some decent people in prisons trying to make an improvement, some decent people in the police who, who are actually doing a good job. And, um, you know, I, I think if I hadn't... I have got regrets... You know, obviously, everyone has regrets. Um, but I think as you can change, you can change. And I'm a bit like a, I suppose I'm a bit like an old war horse, if you like. I still walk past security vans and um, I see a security van. I'm looking at me watch to yeah. see what time they're delivering. <laughs> or, you know, it's just a habit yeah, like yeah, hearing, yeah. The, hearing mm-hmm. the bugle again. Mm-hmm. But I've got... I've, Crime for me is finished, you know. I, I see it for what it is, and it, it was a mugs game in the start in the f- first place, and I carried on with it yeah. too long. Because obviously nowadays you've got cameras, you see yeah. your CCTV everywhere, everything. Can't jump over a it's, bank counter anymore. Changed, and get away yeah, with, yeah, with a, a Santa <laughs> hat on, giving it a ho ho ho. Um, but for coming on today, know it's been some story. It's been one of the best that I've had on my show. Oh, um, but you've got your six, seven, seven books out. Sorry, yeah. how can people buy those books? 
Uh, you can get them through Penguin or um, John Blake is the uh, publisher I'm with now as well. Or Amazon or the internet, you know, they're, they're freely available. Rocket 88 Books does me book about the Ted's and the Punk gang wars. So if you're interested in that, you can get it from them. Yes. Read these books. You've heard the story. It is phenomenal. And I can't wait for your, your new books coming out. And for the future, no. I wish you all the best, brother. And uh, again, I appreciate you coming on our show and telling your story. Oh, that's Thank you. All the best, Brian. Thank you Thank very you. much, Cheers. mate.